just ahead on Art Rocks. Getting your hands dirty is creative and fun. You're using your hands and this is what the people first did. They used a coiling method and they used their hands. The power of the pen. An art gallery takes root in a vacant building. And the majesty of Lake Charles's Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. That's all coming up next on Art Rocks. Support for this program is provided by Georgia Pacific Port Hudson Operations. Like the impulse that drives an artist's creativity, Georgia Pacific's 850 Louisiana employees are driven to produce quality paper products for your home and business. With additional support from the Renaissance Baton Rouge Hotel, centrally located for business and pleasure travel, the Renaissance offers intrigue style and southern hospitality. And by the Watermark Baton Rouge, Art, history, and commerce come together in the heart of downtown Baton Rouge at the Watermark, located in the historic Louisiana Trust and Savings Bank building. And by Prescience Point Capital Management, a fact-based private investment manager using forensic investigation to benefit clients. Research with impact. And by Ann Conley Fine Art, with the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. Hello, I'm James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. Did you ever see a beautiful piece of pottery, like a bowl or a vase, and wish that you could have a go? Around the country, lots of art centres have sprung up to provide guidance for beginners keen to try their hand at pottery making. The Art Factory in Lake Charles offers classes for beginners and workspaces for more experienced artists. The owner, Tracy Lemieux, tells us how that studio took shape. When my children were in school, I was the art aide for the art classroom. The third graders got to make something with clay, and I had never touched clay before. The teacher gave me a piece of clay, and I put it in my hands, and I started just moving it around, and I thought, what is this most wonderful piece of, of material? And I was hooked at that point. I just learned more and more and more about it, and I just really fell in love with clay. And then when we moved here, oh, I guess about eight years went by. And my husband said, it's time to go back and finish your degree. And I really did not think that I would get an art degree, but I went back and took some ceramics classes. Again, fell more in love with the process and more in love with the material. Then I graduated from McNeese with an art degree with a concentration in ceramics. And about a year later, opened up the studio because what I love most about being at the university was the community they're working, you're working, you're watching what they do, you get inspired by each other, you help each other out. So there's that sense of community. That was what I wanted to recreate here for other people to come when they finish the university or, or if they were potters before at one time and they don't have their own home studio. Well, here it is. And then we started getting students and teaching students. It's just really taken off. We teach kids, we teach adults, we have parties, we have fun. You know, it's all about having fun and being creative. One really wonderful aspect about being and working in community is that when you have someone like Kip who has more experience than Caroline does, she was coming in, she was working at the studio and she was very inspired by what Kip was doing and that made her ask more questions and it elevated her. So that's the whole thing about when you're in here and you're inspired by something that you've seen. I just enjoy uh, making, making different forms making things for folks that I know. I have an autistic nephew that wanted me to make him an I Dream a Genie bottle. So I, so I made him one. I just love it. And it has become a passion. It's kind of snuck up on me. Hand building to me is, a, is where you should start because you get to know the medium, you get to know how clay works, and uh, I feel like it's easier to hand build than it is to be on the wheel. Coiling is starting off with a worm, like it's a coil, and then you can coil that up and you can build big giant bases. Your coils can be in all different sizes too, so you can have a small coil, you can have a big coil, and then it can build up faster. Uh, pinch pots you use in your hands, and this is what the people first did. They used a coiling method and they used their hands. It is so exciting whenever that beginner 
gets on that wheel and they're struggling and their hands are just a moving and their whole body is shaking and then when they make something they are so excited they hold it up and they look at it and it's like it's a prize for them so it's really exciting and it is exciting every time somebody who doesn't know how to do it learns how to do this this is Louisiana, so there's no excuse for sitting there on the couch because this state is always brimming with cultural events and attractions. So here's a list of some cool exhibits, performances and festivals coming soon to towns near you. To learn more about these and other events in Louisiana, pick up a copy of Country Roads magazine. Another resource, the Art Rocks website features every episode of the program, so just log on to lpb.org and follow the prompts. There's no shortage of creativity in the Carolinas. Today, we're in the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, where political cartoonist Dwayne Powell looks back on a lifetime of covering the news by writing or drawing between the lines. I used to start out just drawing, doodling, scratching around. Something about the motion of drawing it kind of stimulates something. I would start out with a list of ideas, you know, like uh, legislature, legislature, <laughs> legislature. Well, if I went back to Arkansas to when I first started drawing for the Advanced Monosalonian, the San Antonio Light, Cincinnati Inquirer, and then the News Observer, probably done about 15,000 cartoons. I wanted to be an editorial cartoonist in a capital city, and I wanted to be sure that my philosophy dovetailed with the newspaper I was working for. In my early years at the News and Observer, gosh, we had all these old bulls over there in the legislature. Holzhauser, Jim Hunt, Jesse Helms, cast of characters, you know. I got this is gonna be great. Well, here's one. <laughs> It's when the Democrats and the Republicans were kind of evenly matched, I think, and couldn't really get much legislation through. It was just nothing was going anywhere. Pretty soon after I got to the News Observer, Drew Helms, with his, he was against everything. I decided he was Senator No, so I drew him with a big No stamp on his desk. Everyone was worried about Mexicans climbing over the wall. You know, we were having a big gas crisis and we needed Mexico, so I got Jimmy Carter climbing the wall here, going into Mexico with a gas can. I don't have any problem being mean, but I think a cartoon can be more effective if it, it, it ridiculed the target without hammering them over the head. At the same time, you laughed. If I'm at the news observer and I'm going to work, I do five a week, sometimes six. You know, it gets agonizing sometimes. You know, I might go till five in the afternoon with no idea. Some of my best cartoons have come that way. Well, it usually gets down to the point, you know, where the editor's dragging the thing off your <laughs> drawing board. When I finish one, it's just a relief. And then usually when I'm driving home, I start thinking of the cartoon I should have done. I just love the ambiance of a newsroom back in those days. Typewriters clacking away, just a hive of activity, passing notes around, shouting at each other. <laughs> no, it was a it was a great time to be at the News and Observer. I don't know. You got, a, got anything you want to feed me? Some flood related, maybe something. Uh... The other thing was just election stuff. You know, redistricting maps are out. You could do something funny on that. You know, they come out with new maps. It's the same map. You could have the you know, Republicans making new maps on a Xerox machine. <laughs> His perception of the role is to use humor and images to kind of tweak people. He's, in, he's instinctively opposed to, to power, you know, and sort of holding people to account. It's a sort of a form of dissent, but uh, it's effective, you know. One of my favorite cartoons, coaches were all taking money from Nike. Deaner, Mac, and Hooker. Swoosh mouse. 
cost of gas, food, and utilities, along with tax increases, left us down to the last few bucks. So step right up, here comes the North Carolina Lottery. They're going to solve all our problems. Something I never tired of was after I finished a cartoon, going down and watching the press run. Oh God, you can hear it all over the building. Whenever it starts up, the building will kind of shake. Okay, so this all over here used to be a real hive of activity. Every journalist's dream, I think, was after you finish your work, you get to hear that press run. And you're not gonna hear it here unless you go out to Garner. <laughs> anyway, this is where she used to be. Ripped up to please the financiers in Sacramento. It just tore my heart out, really, in a way. This was the beating heart of the newspaper right here, and it's gone. Big sea change, I think, in journalism. It wasn't just the News and Observer. Perfect storm, that was just when the Daniels sold them to McClatchy. And then after they bought Knight Ritter, they took on a huge debt. The digital age was coming on and really changed the way newspapers get revenue. And next thing we knew, they were laying off people right and left. You know, I watched all my friends, you know, wonderful journalists, marched out the door. I was one of the lucky ones. I retired on my own volition in 09. And I didn't even draw on a napkin for three years. They called up and wanted to know if I would do one a week for the Sunday paper and deal mostly with local state issues. I don't want to dash off a cartoon you know, just because it's a cute subject or something. You want to say something. You want to be right. That whatever opinion I take in the cartoon, and that's what's in my heart. That's what I really think. I'm signing my name to this. And I want to be darn sure that, that I'm philosophically in sync with what I'm putting on, on paper. The GOP is trying to pass a health care bill. The reason I'm focusing on Burr is because he represents North Carolina, so he's been pretty quiet. His silence is deafening in that he's going along with it. I was just walking downtown, decided to wander in the museum. I hadn't been in there in a while. The City of Raleigh Museum, we do a eclectic lot of exhibits that tell Raleigh's diverse and rich history. When I walked in, Ernest said, you know, we think we'd like to do a show of your cartoons. So the City of Raleigh Museum honed in on your profession, that um, as print media kind of goes out of circulation, that um, that editorial cartoonist, which has a long, rich history in the United States, is disappearing. So for us, it's kind of a way to sort of celebrate your work, but also put your profession into a context. So we really looked at political cartooning through the life of the United States. Even back to before the Republic was founded, that some of these political cartoons tried to convey and sway the public in favor of revolution and independence. And it is just part of politics and it's part of American culture. Well, Dwayne, we really wanted to include some of your hate mail and love mail in the exhibit, and by far, this one is my favorite. It says, To he who would sell his soul to sell a cartoon, may the fleas of 10,000 camels rest in your crotch hair. Oh, boy. <laughs> I remember one time, I'd only been at the paper a couple of weeks, and Frank Daniels sticks his head in the door and says, You know, I was at a party the other night, and three people came up and told me I should fire you. And three people came up and said I should give you a raise. So I guess you're doing okay. Editorial cartoons have kind of been replaced as a satire medium by things like the, the Daily Show and satirical comics. The problem is getting eyes on the cartoons. How do we come off of newspapers and start getting more eyes on our work on social media? I just want to be a part of the discussion and hopefully make people think. And laugh. Well, if they want to laugh, it's okay. We're headed up to Dayton, Ohio now to visit the Blue House Gallery and Studios. 
This house stood vacant for a while until it was reborn as a vibrant contemporary art centre in 2014. Artists now gather at the Blue House to collaborate, to create and to exhibit. Come see. The Blue House is a space for artists to live, work and exhibit. Artists from out of town, artists from Dayton. When this particular house sat vacant for over a year, I came out and kind of looked around, looked in the windows. Immediately the front of the house looked perfect for um, an art gallery and the rest of the house just seemed well suited to artist studios because of the sheer size of it. This is Northwest Dayton. This particular neighborhood is Catalpa Woods. I was born and raised right around the corner from this house. I think that any kind of revitalization to Northwest Dayton is important. Any house that is not sitting vacant is certainly a plus. And I think since so many things haven't worked, regular businesses, restaurants, why not bring in the arts? I purchased the home a little over two years ago. Nick, one of my best friends, was just moving back from completing graduate school along with Ashley. And that's when the idea just sort of, you know, took on its own direction. Deanna had asked us if we wanted to create this art center thing with her. And um, I remember us saying, no, that's too much work. It's too long of a commitment. It's too much time. It seemed like there was just a list of every reason we shouldn't do it and get committed to a, like a large project. I don't know what, what made us change our minds exactly. According to Deanna, it only took like a week, but we already had changed our minds and said like, okay, we'll do the art center thing. Let's like go ahead and dive in and make a full commitment. So here we are two years later, home base. <laughs> we actually did a lot of work. We put a bunch of walls up in order to accommodate the studios. We painted, we ripped out carpet, put a lot of sweat equity into the place. And that's sort of where our relationship with the house and with the space started to grow. When I started working on the Blue House, it didn't really have anything to do with me anymore or with my need to create. And that felt really good. It was about making this place. It was about giving other artists an opportunity to travel somewhere and show work to an audience that hadn't seen it before. It was about giving the community in Dayton the opportunity to come here and experience work. The Blue House is funded primarily through volunteer efforts. There's really no actual funding of any sort or any kind of payment. All of our shows are free. The artists don't get charged anything to show work here. The guests that come to shows don't have to pay anything. Even our refreshments, all of that is free. All we ask is like a donation, if possible. If not, it's not that big of a deal. We're just kind of yeah, giving ourselves kind of to the community in that sense. I think the reception has been really, really positive. We've had people from all walks of life come through, from friends and family, to people in the neighborhood, to people that are very active in the arts community and, and practicing artists themselves. We have a very come-as-you-are feel to just get in the door. It's like going to someone's living room. You don't need to be self-conscious. You don't need to feel like you need to assess and understand the work. Just get your foot in the door, take a look at what fine art can be. Our model is not like anything else that's in Dayton, where it's a live workspace for the people that run it, and then also people that come to install inside of a house. There's a real intimacy within the environment here, and I think that People really respond to that and we've gotten a lot of support, which fuels our excitement and want and need to keep doing this and to keep growing it and to keep making things more exciting and robust for the community. We try and schedule the craziest, weirdest stuff. Stuff that you wouldn't get to see normally in Dayton. Right now we schedule our shows about once a month. Currently we actually are booked though all the way through November with some really exciting people coming in this year, so. I feel really blessed actually to have a new exhibition in my house every single month. I'm able to be engaged in the creative and artistic process from the moment I wake up till the moment I go to bed. Whether it's trying to organize a show, whether it's hanging a show, whether it's just looking at the piece when I'm going from the kitchen to the bathroom. So I actually feel really fortunate. I don't have to ever turn it off. I don't have to put on a different hat. It's always the hat of being an artist or being involved in the work. I find living at the Blue House is kind of, for me, it just kind of always makes me want to be at home. There's 
kind of always something going on and it's always centered around where I live, which feels really strange. It's kind of like being a homebody who's like super, super social. <laughs> like, like, oh yeah, we have like 60 people over every month for dinner and <laughs> like we redecorate the living room with them and <laughs> like they come and hang out in my studio and talk about artwork for like long periods of time. I love the house itself. I love the exhibition space. I love where it's located. I love all the natural light. I love the artists that live here and work here. Mostly, I love the artists that have come together to make it work out and to make the exhibition gallery such a success. We can't leave you without bringing it all back home for another Louisiana treasure. This week, experience the splendor of the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception in Lake Charles. The building is more than 100 years old and it greets visitors with much to appreciate both inside and out. We're in the sanctuary of the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception here in Lake Charles. This church started out as a replacement church for the wooden one that burned down in the Great Fire of 1910. The pastor of the church at the time uh, Monsignor Cramner's got the money together to build this fabulous building that we see in Lake Charles now is one of the uh, landmarks for downtown Lake Charles, landmark for the whole area. It's built in what is called Lombard Romanesque style and that means that it has rounded arches and dark red brick. It's a wonderful, wonderful pile with these fabulous exterior features including the rounded windows and the set-in doors. It's spectacular. On the inside, it's just as spectacular. Now, the cathedral is undergoing renovation as we speak to keep it fresh and upgraded, and the interiors are being weatherproofed, and the exteriors are being ventilation controlled. So there, you'll see some scaffolding possibly around the cathedral, but here on the inside, there's still plenty of the original features that make this church one of the spectacular sites in Southwest Louisiana. The a statuary, of course, is marble, set in niches on either side of the door. Favre and Livade knew how to make a church look like a church. Everything was designed for this church, except the altar. The altar, interestingly enough, was secondhand. It was gotten from the Roman Catholic a congregation of Salt Lake City in the 20s, when the congregation in Salt Lake City built a larger facility for themselves and uh, bits and pieces of the altar came down to Southwest Louisiana as 2,700 pieces of marble. It was put together by one of the Italian families here that were a family of stone cutters and stonemasons, and the wonderful main altar and side altars at the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception were secondhand, put together, but they look spectacular in the setting. The church, of course, has a wonderful domed uh, appearance. The uh, interior vaults are highlighted by very high stained glass windows with wonderful designs. There are Celtic designs, not designs, all around the main windows and it really gives a very lacy-like look to the stained glass windows which depict various uh, points in the life of the Virgin Mary for whom the church is named. You can see the Virgin Mary cradling the crucified Christ on the window in the transept on the north. So it's the story of Christ seen through the eyes of his mother. And that's the general theme for the stained glass windows in the Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception. The motherly care of, of Christ's mother towards his life of ministry. Most of the stained glass was done in Europe. Europe, of course, was a great center for leaded glass and stained glass. And of course, the congregation here in Lake Charles, being made up of many Italians and uh, Spanish and French, had connections in the old world. So many of the, the sources uh, that uh, Faber and Livaday used were European sources. Now, the uh, oak pews are actual American oak, but many of the features were created in the old world and purchased specifically for this church, chosen by Favre and Livade, are given as gifts by members of the congregation in the 105 years this church has been a fixture in Lake Charles. The columns, of course, are beautifully decorated with stenciling all the way up, and the interior vaulting is Gustavino vaulting. It actually gives you the, the structure of the building. 
those stuccadoros, and that's what they were called, the people who applied the stucco on this church knew exactly what they were doing. This vaulting is the same technique that would be used in New York City. One of the particular glories is the ceiling vault above the main altar. There's a fabulous fresco of the Immaculate Conception as viewed with the attending angels, and it really provides a very spectacular and intimate view of that particular part of Christian doctrine. In the uh, 1940s and the early part of the 50s, there was a problem acoustically with this building and with a little bit of effort. The congregation chose to put acoustical tiling on the walls here above the marble wainscot, and that tiling has interfered with the natural breathing of this building. So in terms of uh, keeping this building for another 150 years or longer, the congregation has had the tiling removed so that it can be replaced and repaired. And that's part of what's going on right now. The, the building is being made weather tight and being brought up to, to date with the most modern preservation methods available. So they're replacing all of this. That's why it looks like oyster shells on the walls. Kind of nice actually. I find it kind of attractive and pleasant. This is a wonderful congregation and a fabulous architectural element. And it's like Charles's Cathedral, and it's a beautiful example of revival of the restoration of the regrowth and rebirth after the Great Fire of 1910. And that is that for this edition of Art Rocks. But remember, you can always watch episodes of the show at lpb.org slash Art Rocks. And meanwhile, Country Roads Magazine makes another great resource for learning what's going on in the arts all across this state. So until next week, I'm James Fox Smith, and thank you for watching.